quite a lot of the triggers for the events are the same. You know, the riots that happened in 1966 happened against the backdrop of a national scene that was full of uh, turmoil. I just remember it was a shock. I remember the fear. I remember the, the chaos. The national backdrop included the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, Vietnam War, and the LA riots of 65. Racial tensions were brewing all over the country. Here at home on Dayton's west side, a white man shoots an unarmed black man and all hell breaks loose. September 1st, 1966, an unidentified white man drives around looking to make trouble. Lieutenant Daniel Baker, who's now retired, was a beat cop at the time. Part of his patrol area was Broadway Street at 5th. And he just waited till he saw someone standing out on the street. The white man, in a black neighborhood, pulls up to a 30-year-old known businessman sweeping the sidewalk. He uh, opened fire and he shot and killed a man named Lester Mitchell, shot him in the face and drove away. Despite witness descriptions, the gunman was never caught. Justice never served. What happened next was days of chaos. Daria Dillard Stone was in the 10th grade and lived on Broadway Street. It was a shock. I remember the fear. I remember the, the, the chaos. But we were sheltered. You know, our parents would not let us go out uh, by ourselves for years. That's because immediately following the fatal shooting, violence erupted. There were fires, lots of rocks thrown, a lot of people injured, about 150 arrested. Some of my cousins got killed. Some of my cousins and family members, I understand, were doing some looting. Police did what they could the first two days, but it wasn't enough. Because at that time, the Dayton Police Department only had 350 officers, only 14 of which were black. The National Guard was activated. 1,000 armed troops took over the west side. These pictures show the firepower that was brought in against the wishes of an up-and-coming Democratic leader in the city, C.J. McLenn. Uh, almost uh, immediately, uh, as soon as uh, uh, C.J. Uh, saw how serious it was, he, he, he got his people on the phone to call some of the young black professionals. Willis Bing Davis, a young art teacher at Colonel White High School at the time, was one of several who got that call to come to C.J. McLean's office. And get there no matter what. We had to do to work around the police and the, and the roadblock. The group was charged with a huge task. Hit the streets where the rioting was happening and try to bring peace. Encourage young people to stop the looting and the rioting, essentially keeping them from getting arrested or worse, shot. So we had to raise our hand, uh, take a pledge. We also was given a white hat, so we were the white hats. When officers saw the white hats, they knew it was a sign of peacemaking, not troublemaking. It was a difficult job, but Willis and others were ready. Yeah, no order and, and, and unfamiliar faces in the neighborhood and people with, with guns. Uh, outwardly, you know. There was no time for hesitancy, only the goal to end the uprising. More than 150 arrests later, it was over. The riots, using today's figures, cost the Gem City nearly $380,000, many casualties, and the loss of black business and livelihoods. For young Daria in high school, it was something she would never forget. We've come a long way, but we're poisoned. It's so much poison in the places where there needs to be peace. Lieutenant Baker, Bing Davis, and Daria Dillard Stone all agree on one thing in retrospect. Well, I really believe in that phrase Winston Churchill said about it. People will, when we forget history, we'll repeat it. Which is why those who lived the 1966 riots say, today, knowing what went on here in Dayton 55 years ago is so vital. For Dayton Gets Real, Letitia Perry, New Center 7.